Welcome to the 459th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with John Burley, author of the novel Surrender the Dead. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is John Burley, author of the new novel, Surrender the Dead. Burley's earlier novels have included The Absence of Mercy, The Forgetting Place, and The Quiet Child. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jeff. It's great to be here. If someone hasn't heard yet about your novel, Surrender the Dead, how would you describe the novel? So Surrender the Dead is a slow burn psychological thriller that takes place in Northeast Montana. Essentially, it's a town in which about 15 years ago, there was a series of disappearances. And unfortunately, the police were not able to unravel the mystery at the time. And the town has moved on, but the disappearances still linger in the town's memory. Aaron Reese is the protagonist of the book. And after the series of disappearances in her childhood, she decided to leave Wolf Point and try to make a new life for herself. Unfortunately, she has called back to her hometown because her father gets ill and she needs to go to the hospital to check in on him. And while she's there, all of the old memories come back and she has to face new terror in the town that resurfaces with her arrival. And so do you remember the original impetus or idea that led you to write Surrender the Dead? So I, I thought I, I, I tend to write standalone thrillers that occur in small town America. And I grew up in a small town. My parents still live in this kind of a town. And unfortunately, my mother has been ill. My father's been home taking care of her for many years now. And I think about the that journey that he takes when he's home caring for for family and myself and my siblings life has taken us elsewhere and when you're away the small town continues and i ha- have been t- toying with that, this idea for some time now thinking about what kind of man he he's become over the course of the years and how the experience has changed. What was your writing journey before you got your first novel? I, I wrote a lot of different things throughout college and, and uh, medical school. I, I went to medical school and did an emergency medicine residency. And during that time, I detailed the experience and different writings that I would just send out to friends and family to keep them updated as to what was going on. I also did some short stories, but I always longed to be a writer. And I knew that when, once I finished residency, that was the time to get started. And I, I just said to myself, if I don't start now, I'll, I'll never begin. And so I started that first chapter, wrote a chapter over the course of a day or two, then of course had to, to leave to go off to work. And, uh, and when I came back, I, I, initially when I had finished the chapter, I was pretty happy with the way it turned out. But when I came back, I, I reread it just to make sure that it all sounded good. And when I reread it, I realized that someone had broken into my house and rewritten the chapter in a, in a very horrible way. And so I had to go back and edit the chapter and, uh, and and make it better. I think that was my first lesson in writing is that most of writing is rewriting. And that was a good sort of introduction to the world of writing. And and what was that what was that kind of process like for you? You had done as you mentioned you had, you had written some short stories, you you had mentioned you had written some about your medical school and your residency. So what was it like when you sat down to start working on a novel? Was it a challenge or what was that experience like for you? I think it's something that is is such a large task that at first when you sit down to write a novel it's quite there's some freedom in it too in that you haven't written anything down yet and and the story can go anywhere you want to take it and so there's some excitement anytime you start a book but it's also this massive task that you're about to undertake and you can't of course you can't get it all done in one sitting and so you just learn to plug away my first book i wrote while i was still working full time and uh, there was there, there was no deadline, and so I was just able to plug away at it over the course of a couple of years until I got it finished, and then submitted it to various agencies. 
And, and then I really learned what writing was about because, of course, they asked me to go back and make changes and edits and, <laughs> introduce, and introduce me to HarperCollins, which has been a fantastic publisher. And, and my editor, of course, wanted me to make additional changes. And it became a collaborative process rather than a, a, a very individual one, which is how it usually starts out. So it's a learning curve and uh, you have to trust, I think, the people that you work with because these are folks who know the, the industry well and also are able to guide you in, in, in the conception process and, uh, and the development of the work. So it's been fun and, and it's, just been, it's just been a great ride. So as you were working on that novel, and even before that, when you were working on short stories, are, were there writers or novels that inspired your own kind of writing journey? Yeah, I, I, I grew up on mysteries. When I was a, a child, I, I used to read The Hardy Boys and, and stay up late at night with a flashlight under my covers reading long after I was supposed to be asleep. And that really just got me interested in the world of, of mysteries, thrillers. I read a lot of Stephen King as I was growing up, loved his work and other writers as well. That just really captured the imagination, took you into the story, gave you ca- characters that were very palpable on the page. I I feel like no matter what the story, you have to care about the characters and, and the characters have to be three-dimensional and interesting. Otherwise, whatever happens to them doesn't really matter, at least in my, at least in my mind. And so uh, that was my, my early inspiration. Are you still working as an emergency room physician? Yeah, so I'm still working full time as an emergency department physician in the midst of all the craziness over the course of the last uh, year or so. It's been hectic, uh, stressful, but uh, it's also been an opportunity to continue to reach out and relieve suffering and help people as best I can. And so that's a very fulfilling part of my life. I, I, I always come home and feel like this is this was a day worth worth spending. It was a, a opportunity to make a difference, and I really like that part of my life. It's it makes it a little difficult to be a novelist on the side because writing books takes a lot of effort and time, and so certainly medicine competes with that. But I think the two complement each other. They're very different parts of the brain. And, and some of the experiences that I have in medicine, I'm able to bring to the page as well. So it's, I, I like doing both of those activities. Has the stress of the pandemic impacted your writing? Probably. Still figuring yeah, it out? I, I, I think it's impacted all of us. It's, yeah, yeah. It's been a very difficult time. And there's the immediate risks that you take every time you you know go to work and every time you come in contact with a patient, you think to yourself, this could be the encounter that I contract the illness. And uh, you can see it in, in the, uh, the attitudes of your patients that come in. You know, people are stressed and people are worried. And it's been hard over the course of the last year. We're all just trying to make it through. And I think during that time, of course, I'm developing work. I'm putting thoughts on the page. And those thoughts come from your own personal experience. So I'm, I'm sure that it's shaped my writing over the course of the year. Sure. So what was your writing process when you were working on Surrender the Dead? Do you outline extensively before you start working or what's your process? Yeah. So I tend to, what I, what I like to do, what I prefer to do is to start with an idea and a set of characters that I find interesting and know where those characters are going to end up at the end of the book. And then I try, I, I try to just start connecting the, 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 the dots uh, along the way and, and, and writing as I go, shaping the story as I go, finding, finding connections. That's my preferred way to write. It's somewhat at odds with the preferred method for my, my editor, my agent. They, they like to know, okay, what are all the plot points here? Where, where are <laughs> they going? What are the twists along the way? And they really push me to to be a little bit more organized in 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 my thoughts and in my outline. They really push me to have a plot proposal where I, I outline the entire story, how things go, the arcs of the different characters. And so I think there's some push and pull there. I do my best to honor their requests, but I also know that in my I write best by moving forward and, and, and discovering the book along the way. It's what for me it's what keeps the book interesting because I have to be interested in, in, in the progress of the story as well as the reader. Sure. Given your given your success with your novels to date, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? So I think that it's anytime you sit down to uh, create a work, create a world and 
and characters. I, I, I just like really applaud the effort of folks that are you know working on this because it's writing is hard work. It doesn't come easy. They, I, I always thought that as I wrote more books, as I got some experience in this, it would get exponentially easier. And it doesn't. I would say, if anything, it gets harder. So you have to have a love for it and an and, and enjoyment of the process. There is really no finish line. You may finish a book, but then there's always editing. There's always rewriting. And, and, then you, and then it lingers in your mind afterward. You always think about that chapter. Maybe I could have done something different with this. I could have gone in a different direction with this character. And even when works are quote unquote finished, they're, they're, they're still oftentimes lingering in your mind. And then there's always the next book. You have to really enjoy the process and you have to put the time in. That's just comes down to putting your butt in a chair in front of a computer and spending the time because oftentimes I think it's easy to to say to yourself, I'm waiting for inspiration or I'm waiting for that great idea to really percolate. And at least for me, sometimes things happen when I'm away from the computer and as far as story development, but most of the work is actually one-on-one with the computer and, and moving your way through the story bit by bit painful agonizing chapter by painful agonizing chapter and, <laughs> and, and and ultimately having a work that you think is good and then taking that work and, and going back doing some rewrites distributing it to people that you trust and getting opinions and then listening to the overarching recommendations that people have because people I think people generally have good insight into what makes a story work and what doesn't and if if one person tells you something that's a good piece of information, but if four people say the same thing, then you have work to do. You need to go back and make some changes to make things better. There, every story can be better. Sure. What novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Yeah, so I'm right on the, in, in the early uh, chapters of uh, Blacktop Wasteland by S.A. Cosby. I tend to gravita- gravitate toward novels that are thrillers in some way. I like crime fiction quite a bit. Glenn Eric Hamilton wrote a series that started with a, a, a book called Past Crimes, and it's excellent. There's, you know, I, I like Lou Burney's work, and so there's just multiple very talented writers out there in, in the sort of mystery thriller community that are doing great work right now. That's great. Where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels? Sure. So my uh, website is uh, www.john-burley.com. And I'm, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, and I'm on Facebook as well. Great. Again, we've been speaking with John Burley, author of the new novel, Surrender the Dead. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And John, thanks for doing this interview. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Jeff. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of Surrender the Dead by John Burley, performed by Susan Bennett, available from Harper Audio wherever audiobooks are sold. It was something small that built to a fury. The weather report out of KVCK predicted light snow, an accumulation of two to four inches that would taper by mid-afternoon. By northeast Montana standards, that was practically a summer day. Three years ago, it snowed in early June, two days shy of the end of the school year. Angela Finley was only eight then, but she remembered it, the way the morning sky had gone from light blue to a dense mat of gray, while she stood there at the corner bus stop with her mother. She'd worn a yellow dress that day, something that was too small but worth holding on to. That doesn't fit you anymore, her mother said, when Angela appeared in the kitchen. But Angela had wanted to wear it anyway knowing that the dress would soon be hanging in her sister Monica's closet instead of hers. Just one more thing she'd be forced to surrender. Combing her hair this morning in front of her bedroom window, Angela looked out at the February haze and thought about that dress, the color of lemonade and daffodils and afternoon sun. It hung in the dark now in the back of her sister's closet, just as she'd known it would. But on that day, in early June, she'd been running late, and there had been no time to change. It was a small victory to leave the house in that dress. 
one dampened only by the dropping temperature. As Angela stood at the corner, her mother had turned back to fetch her daughter's jacket, but the bus had arrived while she was gone, and Angela had climbed aboard. By the time the driver pulled into the school parking lot, the day had gone cold, and Angela's breath had made tiny plumes of smoke as she walked toward the building. It had not yet begun to snow, but she had felt it coming, like the distant roll of thunder before a summer storm. She'd learned that day that winter was a wild thing that could visit whenever it wanted, and she thought about that now as she descended the flight of wooden stairs toward the kitchen. Wear your boots today, her mother told them, as Angela and her sister sat at the table over breakfast. It's cold outside. Radio says it might snow. Yes, ma'am, Angela responded. She glanced at Monica, who was dragging the back of her fork across a thin film of jelly on the surface of her toast. Dan Finley stretched his right leg out beneath the table and tapped the seat of his younger daughter's chair with a steel-toed work boot. Hey, he said, you hear your mother? Monica looked up and nodded her head, her brown curls bouncing like a collection of miniature pogo sticks. The room fell silent as their father studied the two of them, his gaze moving from one face to the other and back again. He curled his fingers around the handle of his coffee mug, lifted it to his lips, and took a sip. Angela's mother dried the surface of the counter with a hand towel, folded it once, and draped it over a hook attached to the cabinet below the sink. You girls get your books together, she told them. Bus will be coming soon. Monica slid out of her chair and left the kitchen, humming a song from one of her favorite TV shows. Angela lingered at the table, her eyes on the crust-laden plate in front of her. If we get snow, can I go sledding with my friends? Her father took one last sip of coffee and pushed his chair back from the table. Shovel the driveway first, he said. It gets dark early. Make sure you're home before then.